Can I request everyone to take their seats, please? So the uh, next session is, uh, I believe, a fairly anticipated one on uh, what could be the possible power market design for India to accommodate higher levels of uh, variable renewable energy into the grid. Uh, so it, it'll be a basic open house. So we will start with uh, uh, inviting Dr. Chatterjee from CERC and uh, Sri S.K. Suni also to come onto the podium, please. And then we'll invite the international uh, experts who joined us on various aspects of the market. So Bivu from Southern California Edison. Bivu, if you could please come onto the stage. Jerry Milariu, FERC USA. Donna Melinda, FERC USA. And Guillermo Batista from CalISO. So as I said, this is an open house. We'll start by uh, letting Dr. Chatterjee and uh, sure, Dr. Chatterjee and uh, Sri Suni uh, pose a few leading questions to the international speakers that we have on what they feel should be the way to design the Indian energy uh, uh, the power markets in particular uh, to accommodate higher levels of VRE, and then. Uh, the floor would be open for us to ask questions uh, for the rest of the audience. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Subrangshu. Good evening, everyone. All those who love market are present now, at least. And uh, who does not want to peep into future? All of us. So how we should go about in India is something this uh, round table is all about. <coughs> uh, we have a very exalted panel. Uh, each one from FAC and from Utility and uh, we have Dr. Chatterjee, my co-chair. So before I take a long time, I will hand it over to Dr. Chatterjee to uh, set the context and then we will go through the question. Dr. Chatterjee. Tough task, <laughs> setting the context but uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, good evening everybody and, uh, and good to see such a large gathering at this we hours and uh, when we are almost towards the fag end of the workshop. <coughs> uh, well, just to set the context, uh, mm, yes, in India we uh, have embarked upon an ambitious uh, uh, target of uh, ambition, uh, ambitious plan of uh, redesigning our uh, wholesale market to start with. In fact, we are also talking in terms of large-scale change in the retail sale market as well, but uh, uh, if I focus only on the wholesale market design, it's a, a big, big change which uh, uh, we have envisaged at this moment and a uh, couple of discussion papers uh, are already in the website of the Central Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, which basically chart out a roadmap as to how we want the wholesale market in the power sector in India to move forward uh, as we go along. And we have discussed in those discussion papers uh, what the current challenges are and uh, why we are wanting to change the way we are uh, operating our system, power system today. Uh, we have discussed uh, the need for redesigning the um, whole uh, the, the day ahead market. We have also talked about the real time energy market and uh, of course in the last leg on the ancillary services market. Uh, we do have uh, a day ahead uh, market in uh, one sense, uh, but the depth of the market is uh, small. It's about 4% of the total energy uh, generated in the country, uh, what we call it a short term market, part of a short term market. Uh, this is basically on a centralized dispatch mode. Uh, rest of the uh, market which is uh, almost about 90 to 91 percent of the total energy generated get 
transacted through long term contracts and they don't uh, go through the market. So we uh, call it a self scheduling process. Unlike in US, uh, these self scheduled generators don't need to go through the market. So we don't uh, know the marginal cost of these generators, which get scheduled on a day ahead basis. So what we have proposed is a centralized dispatch model where we want all the uh, generators uh, to bid based on their marginal cost and so do we want uh, the load serving entities to come onto the uh, day ahead market to meet their day ahead uh, power requir uh, energy requirements. Uh, what we have, but in this whole process the issue of uh, of uh, handling the existing legacy contracts uh, becomes very important and uh, we have dealt with that also at length in the discussion paper uh, suggesting, uh, suggesting some way forward which uh, is unique to India because uh, most of the contracts that we have here in India are long term contracts for about 25 years or so and uh, for these 25 years, the load serving entities uh, get weight logged and are required to pay the uh, fixed costs or the capacity charges of these plants. So suddenly if we want to switch over to a centralized dispatch model, how do we protect the existing legacy contracts? It's not only a question of uh, protecting the interests of the existing contracts, but also uh, ensuring that that uh, the load serving entities continue to have interest in in contracting capacity because energy only and energy only markets are always fraught with number of with a number of risks and we have international experiences ranging from <clears throat> UK to California to other parts of the world where and we have suggested in the discussion paper that possibly we need, based on the, given the international experiences, we need a mix of both. But the way we have uh, thought of re redesigning, uh, we believe that the load serving entities as well as the generators would uh, take a call as to what extent they need to hedge their capacities in future and to what extent they can play into the real-time energy market or the day ahead or the real-time energy market. Uh, as a sequel to that, we have the real-time energy market. Again, we have discussed uh, at length what the issues are on the real-time energy market and I briefly explained uh, that uh, day for yesterday as well, that uh, after the day ahead scheduling, whether it is uh, self-scheduling or through the market, uh, the load serving entities or for that matter the generators lean on the grid or what we call here the unscheduled interchange to meet their real time energy requirements. I mean while the, re the, the unscheduled interchange mechanism, the deviation settlement mechanism what we call today here in India is only meant for inadvertent uh, imbalances but over a period, the way the <coughs> UI scheme evolved here in India, the uh, natural tendency had been to depend on or lean on this UI mechanism to meet your energy needs in the real time as well. We wanted to dis dissuade people uh, from this and then we made the unscheduled inter inter UI charges or DSM charges very stringent. This was one way of dissuading them from leaning on the UI mechanism to meet their real-time energy needs. And at the same time, we created a framework or we are in the process of creating the framework, <coughs> creating the framework where uh, we would give them a, a common platform where they can come and meet their real-time energy requirements. So next in the sequence is the ancillary services, which is Basically, what we are wanting a co-optimization when you are creating a real-time energy market. You <clears throat> so what we are envisaging that you need to procure ancillary services through 
market based mechanism and wh while you do that starting from the day ahead down to the real time you co-optimize the ancillary services along with energy so it's a co-optimized model which we are conceiving and we are coming up with that discussion paper is also on, already there on the website but based on that we are almost at the final stage in terms of coming up with a draft regulation on the market-based ancillary services mechanism. So this is by and large the sequel in terms of the reforms and the, uh, and the way forward uh, in India on the wholesale market design. But in this whole context, the, <clears throat> the contracting, the, the, the contracting, how you do the contracting in future, that again uh, has also become equally and critically important. We have also been thinking in terms of creating a capacity market in the way it is understood elsewhere. We have uh, here capacity only market. In fact, today, whenever we contract capacities, we can tra contract capacity and energy together for such a long period. But over a period of time, this concept of base load and what we have found that, in fact, you know, you have uh, classical examples of the states or the load serving entities who have been contracting uh, long term contracts based on their peak load. So suppose if Delhi has a peak load of 7500 megawatt, they would be possibly contracting the base load of 7500 megawatt. And so there are times when the base load is to the extent of about 4500, so you are left with a large part of your uh, portfolio gets or remains unutilized during uh, a couple of months when your base load is to the extent of 4,500. So one is thinking in terms of capacity contracting, what are the ways, and there are seasonal variations as well. So how do you, how do you address these uh, differences in terms of your seasonality? You have to have adequacy of resources. And we are also working on resource adequacy and uh, resource uh, sufficiency. So capacity contracting is important. You need to demonstrate that you have adequate, you have contracted adequate capacity. And when you, have, when you are able to demonstrate that, at least you are ensuring that that much capacity is available for trade in the real time energy, the day ahead or real time energy market. So that's the overall con construct. And uh, linked to that is also the financial derivatives and uh, we are thinking in terms of, because off late, if you have a look at the trend in terms of contracting by the load serving entities, uh, off, late, uh, uh, off late there is reluctance on the part of these entities in entering into a very long term contracts. 25 year long contract with uh, comfort to the generating stations of recovering their full fixed cost uh, based on their availability. These things are possibly going to become history in India and, uh, and uh, so, so in that context we are also working on how to introduce forward contracts, forwards which are not necessarily the financial contracts and also financial derivatives we have in fact resolved, almost resolved the jurisdictional issue between uh, CERC and SEBI in terms of the uh, in terms of jurisdiction over physical and financial contracts. There was a lot of confusion, some court cases, etc. And we are almost on the verge of reaching an agreement that uh, physical contracts would be regulated by CERC whereas financial contracts would be regulated by SEBI. So once that uh, comes by, even physical forward contracts uh, for one year, two year or three year duration, they can become a reality in the power exchanges. And, but then we will also need f hedging instruments by way of financial derivatives, uh, which will also uh, be needed, and, but then they will be regulated by SEBI. But then these are uh, things of future. We have, uh, at least we have been able to conceive the construct of a robust wholesale market design with the ultimate objective of uh, achieving economy and efficiency in power system operation uh, so that consumers at the end of the day 
benefit uh, big, by way of uh, efficient and economical dispatch of uh, uh, this uh, whole mechanism. We have in fact taken a number of steps which are short but very important like uh, Mr. Suni has been working on, I mean, on this security constraint economic dispatch uh, model which I'm sure he would have explained uh, in course of the… So this in fact uh, is, has given a lot of insight and I'm sure he would share experiences partly as he uh, uh, speaks on that. So that also has given us a good insight in terms of before we embark on real-time energy market because how you do the optimization closer to real-time. And there are a number of other issues which you are trying to, you know, transmission planning and transmission pricing are also big challenges here in India. We have already created a framework of what we call the point of connection transmission charges. It has, uh, it has thrown some challenges and we are uh, working on redesigning the transmission pricing mechanism as well. And in uh, during the break, I was trying to understand the concepts of FTRs and congestion uh, revenue management, how the, these things happen. But uh, uh, Mr. Suni, I mean, given, the, uh, given this brief background, uh, I mean, what of course would be important for us to learn uh, from the eminent panelists that we have is how do we, what are the safeguards that we need to have how do we leapfrog, how do we move forward, what, is the, what are the bad things that they have seen and what we should learn on. That's in brief from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. So, it's basically wholesale uh, reform of the wholesale market, you know. And uh, where we have to go, that is uh, more or less the regulators are clear. The issue is we are here, we want to go there. How do we go there? That's the issue. And uh, the subject is quite complex. Uh, ever since Monali told me that this is a session, I was writing down some hundred keywords I wrote, but I didn't like any of them because I knew that everybody knows about those keywords. So for a, my simple understanding of the complex system in three words is, you know, everything is interacting with everything. Nobody is in full control. And the last one, nobody knows the whole thing. <laughs> so. Seeing these four experts, I will put four questions uh, in sequence and you all uh, try to give very succinct and focused answer because Dr. Chatterjee has uh, set the target that we got to reach there and where we are that also he has explained. So, and, and I am not going to ask any difficult questions on market. I am asking very, very simple questions, okay? So, the, my first question is that uh, all four of you are from US, very developed market, uh, very difficult to understand also. And uh, if you get four experts also, they find it very difficult to understand each other. So that's the kind of a complexity which is there. We want to also cause economy and uh, have market. What in your view should be the sequencing of different products? For example, one thing I know that you can't have derivative unless you have underlying variable state. So this I know, but knowing all other things, when should be effort, uh, FTR, when should be, what should come in what sequence? This is my question number one. For example, uh, uh, I, 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 and, and for the timekeeping, I will not take more than two minutes, I should not take. And five o'clock we have to close because there is another session. So that, uh, you know, uh, constraints also we have to keep in mind. So for example, we got, uh, you know, normally I see that uh, we should have first the security constraint economic dispatch, then came ancillary, then came congestion, th and like this. We got it just the other way around. First the uh, congestion, then the ancillary, then the security constraint economic dispatch. So when I do a survey of 70 years, I realize, okay, that's also possible in thermal power plants, you construct first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth, fifth floor. In hydro, you construct first the fifth floor, fourth floor, third floor, second floor. So from crown, you go. So you, that's it. So I want to know about sequencing. That's the first question. The second question I want to know is, which are the areas where we can leapfrog with least regret? Huh? That's something, if you can tell us. And some of, uh, you know, utility like uh, my... 
a counterpart uh, in uh, PJM, Terry Boston, one day whispered me in my ear that move to 15 minutes, move to 5 minutes quickly. We can't do any more now in this country. So those kind of a tips if you can give. Where we should move very quickly, otherwise it will be difficult. That's the second one. The third one which is of concern to me is what are the a priori? What are the hygiene factors? What are the ecosystems which are a must? Before you give me a recipe, please tell me what kind of a kitchen are you expecting. Otherwise, I get a lot of recipe and I go back, my kitchen is not equipped. So that's the uh, third question uh, which I want to know. For example, technology, deployment, vendor support, human resources and things like that. That's the third. And the last question is, what are the mistakes which we should not do? We should learn from others' mistakes. We will also make mistakes, I always say, but you know, little cheaper mistakes, not a very costly mistake. We don't want to make very costly mistakes. And what should be the pace for these kind of things? What is the timeline? Can it be done tomorrow? Certainly not. Would you allow a decade? Dr. Chatterjee will not allow a decade. So what is that time frame that, yes, this is a relatively you know, plausible uh, time frame in which you can have. I hope um, I have put in a very clumsy fashion my questions. So uh, uh, you can uh, choose your own order and uh, give us a very succinct reply. I will note down on each of them that all four, what are they saying. And then within 15 minutes we'll finish this and then the house will be open and we must uh, take questions. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I will not start in order. But let me jump in one that I can react on the spot. Uh, I think one of the questions is related to timeline. I would say that it's quite dependent on the reality of the system that you want to deal with. And I can give you a couple of examples. For instance, uh, if I take my own example from the California ISO, it took us a year to reach the point where we are right now and reach the point of going officially live. It took us basically seven years or eight years to reach the point of full implementation of the ideal market we wanted to start with. And life doesn't end there. From there, you have to just keep going and adjusting, changing based on the actual operation of your market and the systems. Uh, for instance, in the last recent years, I, I have been helping other countries with training about implementation of markets. Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico. I can tell you, for instance, a lot of the reality of these countries is quite different to the United States. The example of, for instance, of Mexico. They have a federal entity, centralized uh, federal government where basically by law they said, we are going this direction and that's it. It took them two years to implement a capacity market, a spot market, a certificate for renewable energy markets, a long-term contracting in a matter of two years. Two years maybe it took us just to define what the requirements should be in our market. So we cannot miss the reality of each system based on the policy that is driven uh, the changes, based on the politics that are driving the, the changes. And uh, that is going to be very dependent on these factors. The, the timeline, I think we can differentiate it between what takes the, in the technical side to implement versus the non-technical side. I would say the technical side could be always the easy part to implement because you know exactly what to do, you know your capabilities, feasibility for implementation. These other parts are the difficult ones. And that put me into the other question that was related to the components. Uh, when we are talking about implementation of a market or an enhancement of a market, there are several key components that we cannot miss beyond the technicalities of power flows and how to move generators from one point to the other. And that had to do first with the regulatory framework. Any participant wants certainty what they are getting into. If you don't have a strong regulatory framework, who wants to go and play in that market? That is a very key fundamental part of any market that you want to develop. Uh, you need to have this regulatory certainty for the players of the market, 
And obviously, that implies that you have to have very robust institutions, such as the regulatory commission, right? Is the regulatory commission going to have teeth to go after behavioral issues in the market? Is going to have all the expertise developed to be able to chase and evaluate the performance and efficiency of the market? The human factor in many of these cases takes a lot of time to develop. You need expertise not just in power systems, you need expertise from law, from lawyers that understand how the system works so that they can really envision the regulatory framework. You need a lot of uh, IT technology to make feasible the plans that you want to, to have for your market. And this brings in some challenges that we have, for instance, in the implementation of our market, right? You can envision to have a day ahead market that solves every day and you can run hundreds of resources at the same time. Well, is your IT capability able to sustain that? That is where you have to have the reality check and see, well, ideally I'd like to have this model. Unfortunately, I don't have the computing power to do it. I have to scale down my implementation. So uh, all this comes together. And I think, again, one of the key factors is to have these robust institutions that can actually support the implementation. Uh, power markets are a very complex engi uh, engineering uh, machine in which you need economists, lawyers, electrical engineers, IT people, and all of them, at the end of the day, have to understand how a market actually works to make sure that they can really play their part. Uh, the other part that is the sequence, I, I believe, coming from an operator, I would say that the sequence has to be determined basically what your objective is, what your target is. In this case, from the point of view of the operator, narrowly speaking, I would say your target at the end of the day is to still have an efficient and reliable operation of the system. How can you build to still don't lose that component? That means, well, I have to be able to dispatch my unit efficiently my maintain the reliability of my system. Uh, the natural sequence of having this as a target is going to put you that well. Maybe I can start from the looking forward approach. That means I need to first create the markets that are going to be able to sustain this reliable operation of the system. Uh, we may have the sequence of very standard market structures. We have a real-time market, a day-ahead market, and a financial market for transmission rights. That is. Uh, quite common in the United States. And we want to understand why do we need to have each of these markets? Well, let's assume you don't have a financial forward market, you don't have a day ahead market, and you just live with the real time market. That is the minimum you need to operate the system. What would happen if you just have that construct? Well, who wants to participate in the real time market? Nobody, because it's uncertain, it's volatile. Who wants to be exposed in one interval to $10 and in the next interval to minus $30 and in the next interval to $1,000. Nobody. So that is the reason we have to create a day ahead market so that participants can hedge against that volatility. That is the whole reason why we have to create this advanced market one day in advance. Now you have created naturally a mechanism that allows them to hedge that volatility. Well, you have now a real time market, a day ahead market. Are we complete? Not really. Those that are participating in the head market still have uncertainty to deal with, congestion. Well, in order to hedge that congestion, what do you need to do? Well, create a financial market for congestion. That is how we ended up with a market for transmission rights that is a pure financial instrument. If you now go in the opposite sequence, basically you need to first start with the financial market to create the instruments for participants to be able to come into the real operation of the system. So. You go backwards in that sense, and basically you position the deployment of your markets to be able to create incentives first and the guarantee and the certainty to the market participants to, to get into your market. Okay. Thank you, Barista. You are very right. You know, I can see my, uh, you know, uh, imagine you, a system operator, once he gets it, he will say everything he needs. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I, I will tell you, you know, your uh, uh, California ISO CEO, Yakut Mansur, we used to meet him around seven, eight years back and when you were uh, rolling out market. And I exactly agree with you that seven to eight years, two years it takes to you know, have the spec ready 
that's the kind of thing. Uh, so, thank you. I have just noted down. I will not take much time. And uh, so, you know, in order to have a balance, let me start from Melinda. You know. Thank you. Um, I would say, from the regulatory perspective, the rules are constantly evolving. Um, you have to react to things that are happening. Um, say, for a sore example, for some of our panelists here, the California energy crisis um, resulted in. Uh, my commission uh, getting enhanced uh, enforcement authority because we didn't have enough authority to deal with what was happening in California. So I think things happen in the market and you have to be prepared to react to those. Um, you also have to, you're constantly making changes to the market in reaction to technology changes. Um, and that's something that we've seen a lot of we, we constantly have market changes that are going on to react to those sorts of, of incidents. So um, I think you can learn a lot from what we've, we've in the United States, are, we sort of let a thousand flowers bloom, so we have all these different um, versions of markets, and you can sort of see what things have worked and what haven't, um, different ways of implementing things, but all of the markets are constantly evolving, so it's never, it's never set. Something to be prepared for. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, next, uh, let's uh, have Vibhus. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, thank you, Sony sir. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. And uh, I think this is truly exciting. I'm, in my in my 15-year utility career, I have had the fortune to be part of Mid-Continent ISO when their uh, uh, day one, which was back in 2005. The real-time markets went live, and then day two, as they call it, the day-head market went live, 2008. And right about that time, uh, at the end of that decade, I moved to California um, to lead uh, 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 part of the, our, our energy trading floor and wholesale market participation. And Kaiso MRTU's market was coming live, uh, which was at that point, at, uh, what an exciting, but uh, was, uh, had pro prolonged too long. It was meant to be market redesign, of 2002, uh, it happened in 2011, finally went live, and they changed the abbreviation to Market Redesign and Technology Upgrade just to make that happen. Actually, our Director of Trade Floor had made a comment passing by that uh, the day Kaiso MRTU will finally launch, pigs will fly in the air. And uh, finally, when it did launch, we had, a, we had a hot air, like a pig, which was flying on the middle of our trade floor. I have a picture of that. So it could be complex, it's a very, um, it could be challenging, but I think India has a great opportunity here. Mid-continent ISO is the biggest ISO, 150 gigawatt order of magnitude, and California ISO is the most complex market, more settlement charge codes in day and real time than PJM and MISO, and um, you can add ARCOT to it combined. That's how much complex it is. Um, there is, just to succinctly answer your four questions, um, I think there is a sequencing to it, there is method to the madness here. Um, as, as you look at ISO and, and, um, and MISO, starting with real time, starting with intraday, and then rolling day head, but rolling day head with a full co-optimization, with a full security constraint co-optimization of energy and all ancillary services, um, with, uh, with the right mechanisms in place. Uh, Melinda talks about, talked about the gaming that happened back in California, and that led to higher authority for FERC, and now KISO has a department of market monitoring which, which monitors bad behaviors, putting in things like bid mitigation and making sure there are clean bids in place, making sure the generators are all asked to certify for all eligible services they can provide. So California ISO, order of magnitude, roughly, let's say, has 1,000 units today that participate in a 50 gigawatt market. Each one of those generators is certified by ISO, whether it can do energy regulation up, down, spin, non-spin, flexible ramping up, down, or any other product. Make sure that is certified, and then if the, if the resource, as we build the resource adequacy market, if the resource is getting a resource adequacy payment through a bilateral contract or through an RA auction mechanism, it, it should have a must-offer obligation. Then other challenge Dr. Chatterjee talked about is Delhi may have 7,500 megawatt peak load. They might send, sign 7,500 megawatt of base load generation. What do we do about it? So CPUC, California Public Utility Commission, which actually monitors resource adequacy, created another product. They call it flexible resource adequacy, FlexiRA. And so uh, all load-serving entities have a resource adequacy obligation, 
which is 115% of their peak load for every month. They have to show that year advance, they have to show quarterly advance, and they have to show month in advance, 45 days before that month. And then you have a flexible RA component that you're kept, not only you have the capacity, you also have flexibility in that capacity. Within four hours, you can ramp X. Within eight hours, you can ramp Y. So th those are the products getting created. So co-synchronizing this RA, flexi RA, making sure there is enough resource adequacy, and then must offer obligation, make sure resource sufficiency. So the market engine can solve and come up with the least cost unit commitment, minimizing the cost for all customers for energy and all ancillary services. If that would happen, it will also um, create opportunities for generators because the beauty of co-optimization is the least cost solution for all customers through the balancing authority is also the most profitable solution for each individual generator for that day. And you can do the math any number of times. A generator, if, if the market dispatches a generator for X megawatt of energy, Y of regulation, Z of spin, that would be the most optimal revenue. You can move the awards around, everything else will have a lower revenue than that. So it creates a right incentive for the dispatchable resources. That should be combined with right incentives for renewable resources. Re renewable resources should be, and forecasting is improving, the, the uh, error ranges are reducing. They should be scheduled day ahead. They should be reforecasted, scheduled real time. And then in actual dispatch, when the 15 minute or five minute uh, ADS instructions come in, it should be about who caused the issue. It, the, that should pay for it. So net negative deviations, whether the load caused the deviation or renewable caused the deviation, the charges for uninstructed imbalance deviation, as, as you were talking about, that should be assigned back to the net causation of where that came from. So having fair, Having, uh, having transparent, comp uh, efficient market. Efficiency, as Guillermo was saying, doesn't come from purely physical. You have to create financial products. The, uh, uh, the, con the convergence bidding uh, process or virtual bidding uh, came out a year after uh, the MRTU market. And to the extent there was any opportunities left in the market, the convergence bidding closes that gap. It brings in other players who will have incentives to find that and that balances out with generator bidding, with the Department of Market Monitoring. That's really the true free market structure. I think that works. Quickly on the other topics, leapfrogging, I think you can leapfrog a lot. SEUC, SEUD is not a rocket science now. There are so many vendors who provide it. You know, Kaiso Engine, Miso Engine. Now, I'm not saying which one is perfect, but you can, you can definitely take stakes. You have a lot, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you can leapfrog a lot. The IT challenges of computation, of publishing, publishing, having an OSS, having the bidding software, optimization integrated with the OMS, integrated with the AGC, with the, ADM, uh, with the ADS system, all of that is already there. It's commercially available. The computation power has, has increased so much, so I think you can leapfrog there. Ecosystems, developing the talent. Glermo was talking about IT, HR, lawyers, uh, technology. I think, so training, investing in those resources, I think that would pay off big time. And then finally, the time frame. I, I don't know what's the answer to it. I think it, sometimes it seems it's simpler than why did it take two, you know, nine years in California where there was so much commitment to roll MRTU. Um, I don't know. There's, perfection could be sometimes enemy of uh, uh, good enough. And uh, at what point we go live, at what point there is enough value to be created, I think that's a key regulatory and a balancing authority POSOCO decision. Uh, but one thing is for sure, the moment you go live with this, it creates a lot of value for generators, it creates a lot of value for, for the customers. So hopefully you can, you can get a lot of support and get going quickly. Thank you, Vibhu. Very focused and very succinctly you have placed the points. I will uh, straight move on to Jeremy and then uh, open the floor for questions. I wish I had gone first because I'm going to have a much more simple answer to everything. <laughs> um, detail, I think the, the biggest shift um, is moving to a centralized least cost economic optimization and everything flows from there. Um, the, versus the bilateral construct. I think there'll, there'll be a strong incentive from incumbent utilities to, to build a hybrid model with maybe a day ahead exchange. I think moving to, to the centralized economic, not just dispatch model, um, is the biggest shift, the efficiency gains. Um, one from just in terms 
of humans making decisions versus a computer making decisions um, over a large footprint, you can't compare that. In terms of sequencing, you know, everything falls from that. Once you have a centralized economic model, there's information, there's data, there's a centralized uh, system that knows everything, that, that sees the startup cost, the, the marginal cost, the locations, the outage rates, and everything. And then, once you have that, you can then build your financial products as they become necessary. Um, the futures market, derivatives market, forward markets, bilateral markets will always be there, regardless of your market design. Companies will find a way to contract and hedge risk between themselves. So I think moving to the centralized is your number one move in terms of sequencing. And then as uh, the CAISO and the MISO talked about, next is virtuals, next is FTRs. That, comes, that, that becomes obvious once you start doing it. Um, from a person that leads a group looking for market design failures, and in, in terms of lessons learned, I think access to data and having the benefit of having RTOs that could provide us transaction level data and unit level data and company level data enables us to track market design failures and manipulation in a much better way. My group also uh, monitors parts of the US that are not in RTOs, that are bilateral exchange markets, including day ahead markets and forward markets. There's no visibility, uh, and when something goes wrong, you, you don't know what happened and how it happened. So think of the, the California energy crisis as a perfect example. You had a day head exchange, and then when that price goes to, to, to $2,000 per megawatt hour, who do you call? And what do you do? How do you figure out what's going on? And then it takes seven months of calling lawyers and and private companies then figure out what just happened. If you have a centralized economic dispatch, you don't have that problem. Thank you. Uh, I will resist my temptation of asking any questions, considering the time. So first, uh, let's have the questions from the audience. If anybody would like uh, any intervention. Good. So I think, oh, here it is. I thought that oh, they have answered so well others that you to, don't need any. Others to ask. Okay. No, uh, I would like, uh, uh, I think most of the questions are covered, but I would like to elaborate further uh, some kind of, a, uh, what should I, should I say, some uh, their views on the battery technology and the use of the battery technology in this RE transition. So I think that part also can be. Uh, discuss a little bit, and that would be great to understand the uh, the battery, uh, the participation of the battery technology in all this market reform, which we talked about. Okay. Battery technology or storage technology, in any sense. Uh, yeah, we had a good discussion at the storage uh, panel. Just, uh, but we did we, what we did not touch on is how how are the ISO markets integrating storage? So I want to give some credit to, to California ISO. Uh, Grimmer is here. Um, Kaiso has uh, has made it happen really to um, even before the FERC order 841 came in and before uh, CPUC's multi-use applications MUA ruling came out. ISO helped uh, with the three IOUs in California, including SCP, Gini, San Diego. Uh, this uh, this uh, re regulation energy management RAM model, and then uh, so where batteries are modeled as non-generating resource just a pure ancillary services up and down, overall net zero, and the other one where they are modeled for generation. And um, that, that helped in, um, especially for us, with uh, we had uh, resources which uh, came online as early as 2013 at the HAP project, Aliso Canyon, Tesla Battery 2016, which are participating in the market, which have been part of California ISO markets for a few years now. But with the FERC order 841 and, and with the M MUA ruling, now there is in, in, in incentives to have um, additional value for distribution connected storage, for behind the meter storage, which were built for capacity or to minimize demand charges. You don't always need them for capacity. That battery may be needed 20% of the time in the year out of 8760 
the remaining uh, 80%, as long as you can coordinate that in advance with your, dist with your distribution network operator or DSO, and if they are not forecasting its usage for the operating day, a day or two out, uh, next day or the intraday, you should be able to offer that in the wholesale market and get additional value. So that is being enabled now. And um, what we don't want to do is a, a, a double counting of reliability services from the battery. So if you want to know more about it, there is a uh, there is California MUA ruling which defines what that double counting rules are. But so single reliability service and then remaining value when not needed. Uh, single reliability service at a time. You could provide different services at different times. But at a time when that assigned service is not needed, you should be able to get some market value. And I think all ISOs across the nation, and I think with quarter 841, that, that is being enabled. And it, it will be needed. We have a vision of 10 gigawatts of storage in California in the next 10 years. We are only less than 1,000 right now, so tenfold, and that will be important. I have a question, um, I guess for all of our U.S. Uh, friends. So my question is, as we are seeing states and different regions moving towards very high uh, percentage renewable penetration, 80%, 100%, my question is, how do you see the wholesale market design evolving? Because your marginal unit is going to look very different in this scenario. It's not going to necessarily be defined by natural gas as the marginal unit. And the reason I'm asking this is because even though we are not at that point yet in India, the economics are driving a different kind of capacity expansion in this country also. And since we're looking at these you know, market changes now, how should we be thinking about where we would need to go you know, if renewables becomes an even higher percentage here, approaching what we're doing in California and other places in the States? Well, we don't have the answer yet because we haven't found it. Uh, I think uh, this is one of the complications of dealing with all this uh, integration of renewable resources. For instance, in California now it's known that we have this target of 100%. Uh, we are right now working to achieve the, the 50%. And uh, there are many unknowns of how we're going to be able to handle that level of penetration. The, the clear answer is we don't know yet. And there are many operational challenges, there are many economical challenges, there are many incentive-based challenges that will have to be figured out. Uh, the reality is that down the road, as we have more and more penetration of these zero marginal resources, the economics, the dynamics are going to be completely different to what we know as of now. What would be the mechanisms to still have these other type of more conventional type of resources participating in the market such that they still have the economical incentive to be there. It's still a challenge that we haven't figured out how that is going to be handled. So all what we know is that we need to reach that point of being able to meet our targets of renewable integration. And as we start progressing, I think we will have to find out the ways to, to handle that, uh, that integration. Uh, there is no one single bullet that answers the problem because it has many different facets. Uh, when we focus, for instance, in the spot market, that is the very short-term market, and we know that all what you are trying to achieve there is the optimal dispatch of your resources. But there is more than that. In order to arrive to that very short time frame, you already have the complications of your investment of all your capacity that you have to have in the systems. And those are subject to many externalities. For instance, incentives for integration of renewable resources are still there. That basically shortcut the economics of conventional generation. How can we internalize an externality into the market? That is still a challenge that we don't know how we're going to deal. Uh, I think in the coming years, all this is going to just give us more incentives to look for out-of-the-box options, and trying to link this other discussion of the batteries, for instance, one of the options is potentially, well, what do we do if we just match all these renewable integrations with batteries? That is the new wave of things coming in the near future. You may have all this volatility of solar resources. Well, what if you match exactly with the same size of a battery that can absorb that volatility and can expand the production of the solar? That could 
give you a, a solution to the operational point of view? Does that give you a solution for the incentives for operation of the system? We don't know yet. Uh, there are many unknowns that at this point we simply don't have an answer for. Thank you. The last question uh, from Thomas. Uh, my question is more regarding transmission investment and markets. Um, you see in many countries that renewables are built, of course, in areas where you have the resources, um, and that's not necessarily where you have the loads. And you already see here in India that uh, the load flow is affected by renewables, and it might become even more severe in the future. And typically the question is then, how do you make sure either that uh, you get enough transmission capacity built, and when is the transmission capacity built, when the renewables is already there, so when you have a lot of congestions, or should you do it before, and what kinds of incentives should you provide, or do you provide location incentives that the renewables are probably moving to areas where the resources are not optimal, so like nodal, nodal pricing typically tries to achieve this one. So how do you want to make sure that um, in the market arrangement and with the transmission system and more there, that the transmission system is always keeping up with the needs for renewable integration. Yeah, I want to uh, maybe 10 seconds answer the previous question as well. I think the market will change from when I grew up in India, it used to cost one rupee 20 cents to make a phone call. And now the plans we have, none of us pay per phone call. We just pay a fixed cost for a phone every month, right? So I think that's, that's how it's going to change. LMP markets will not make any sense if prices are always negative. So it will become more of a fixed cost capacity payment. That's the direction I think it's heading. For the transmission, uh, building, uh, building the right transmission for renewable, the way, the way uh, we relate to it is we as Edison as load-serving load entity, we do our 10-year uh, LTPP, long-term procurement plan. Uh, we do our 10-year DSP, TSP, distribution substation plan, transmission substation plan. It's our job to make sure that our portfolio has enough resources, resource adequacy for, um, into the future. We know which contracts are retiring, will be dropping from our portfolio. We know which utility-owned plants need relicensing, which will be going away. Based on that, we create, we identify where is the, there is a necessity. Is the need for energy? Is it for capacity? Is it local need? Is it system need? We identify that and we file it with our regulator, CPUC. The regulator would, would then uh, would approve for that need and typically ask us to mostly procure that, the right resources to meet the requirement for where the need is. And um, if it is a, we have done, for example, when we retired our local nuclear plant, we did an LCR auction where the capacity was in a particular part of the service territory. We have done system-wide RA procurement. We have done SP15 only RA procurement. So based on where the system needed, all eligible resources will qualify. We'll do least cost, best, best fit, our, our competitive RFP. Based on where the award is, then the, the system operator, Kaiso, is really um, involved in identifying the transmission needs on where the line needs to be built. And now with FERC Order 1000, that would be a competitive process, whether uh, with the utility as a transmission order, uh, operate, uh, owner gets to build it or a third party gets to build it. Once it is built, the cost of it will be in the transmission excess charge that, that California ISO manages. And um, to the extent power flows on that line, that, the tax charge will be paid. Whoever owns that line, they will get a share back of that if, if they invested in that transmission line. So that's typically how the model works to make sure the right transmission is getting built. Having said that, there is so much growth of, uh, resource, uh, of supply in distribution system with the DERs, rooftop solar. Um, the current plan shows uh, some projects in near future and then basically no, n n very little need for new transmission beyond three to five years from now to 10 years from now. And so that, that's just a California story, um, but, um, but the process works to ensure that the, the, the transmission is built based on where it's needed. Thank you. I think it's already, we have our shot five o'clock hard line. So let me very quickly try to pick up some of the points. Uh, first thing is it will evolve, That's, there is no doubt about it. Uh, technology will drive uh, sequence something like resource adequacy, call it flexi-resource adequacy, then RTM, DAM. Co-optimization is a very natural consequence, there is no doubt about it. Ultimately the least cost is the one which uh, we have to work for. And without financial product, without the necessary hedging, uh, you won't get the volumes and uh, that part is there. There is a room for leapfrogging, certainly, uh, because the IT side and the various commercial products are available. 
and uh, institution, certainly institution is absolutely essential. Uh, as a very young student, I read, you know, engineers like writing specifications, economists like to discover right prices, lawyers write writing contracts, but none of them will succeed in their chosen field unless there are sustainable institutions. So institutions of uh, regulatory institutions, system operation institutions, they got to build, that they got to be built. And then, of course, uh, uh, some things uh, we do in the reactionary way also, because the uh, market will throw surprises. Us, visibility, transparency, and all that through uh, other instruments will come. The issues which came up for uh, tariff, we just touched it. Uh, I also strongly feel that we got to move away from the volumetric tariff as the marginal cost of RE being zero, uh, it will just change the whole scenario. But that will take some time. It can't be a single part tariff. Single part tariff by design is unstable, not robust. We must have a multi part tariff. But how to go about that, that's another thing. On transmission, the last one, of course, uh, uh, we will also address that. But there's something, you know, market can do miracles, can do many things, can reduce the cost. But I don't think market can substitute planning. Planning is an apparatus which government and the planning agencies have the responsibility in this VUCA world, they've got to do planning. So I think transmission is something which has to be, by the policy makers and the planners, that has to be taken care of. Of course, the recovery, there has to be some uh, market mechanism. And in India, we have a, a mechanism of a, a point of connection tariff, and, but that will also is evolving and uh, I think with this, um, let me thank all my panelists and I would also request Dr. Chatterjee if he has any last punchline to give. <laughs> First punchline was from me and last punchline, let the last punchline from, be from you as well. But uh, I, as I said, I mean we are learners. Uh, I said what we intend to do, how far we intend to go ahead and uh, we are learning constantly. I mean, even before we came up with these discussion papers and the regulations, we studied to the extent possible the international experiences and more so the oft-quoted <coughs> US and uh, European experiences. We also had the opportunity of interacting with experts from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and we are constantly, I mean, the more we read, the more confused we get and we don't know which is the right model. And uh, we end up concluding that, I mean, possibly we need to find out our own solution. There is no one size fits all kind of a solution for any kind of a market design. So many of the design aspects which you see in our discussion papers as well as the regulations or for that matter the policy are so Indianized, you know, I mean, they have roots in the Indian context, but uh, you also get glimpses of uh, the international experiences and uh, as Mr. Suni said, uh, we have been constantly trying to learn from the mistakes that other parts of the world have made and make sure that we don't uh, trade on the same path and commit the same mistakes. So, uh, we hope that these kinds of workshops going forward uh, help us create a good network and we can continue to interact uh, either physically or through emails in future and uh, keep improvising our uh, systems, policies and regulations. Thanks. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.